with which our culture begins is that everything that has a value can be translated into the value of money. But there are multiple problems with this. The most obvious of which is that not all values can be translated. Money is supposedly an abstract placeholder for value. It allows us to tell how much we care about one thing versus another. The idea is that if something is truly important, people are willing to pay for it. In this way, it's often said that we vote with our dollars. By this reasoning, organic food is not as important to Americans as agribusiness produced food because organic food costs more. If people truly value organic, then they pay for it. On both ends of the market exchange, the value I place in the product is directly translatable into dollars. So it stands to reason, under this model, we could tell just how much you love your mother based on how much money you would ask for in order to pimp her out. That is, if I asked to sleep with your mom, and I offered you ten bucks and you accepted, that, that means you don't love her that much. But if you held out for a lot more, like maybe ten grand for the whole night, that's the sign of real love. Since the time of the ancient Greeks, there has been a well-known distinction between oikonomia and kremestika, between economics and primitistics. As Aristotle knew, the fundamentals of oikonomia were related to the maintenance of the oikos, that's the Greek word for house, home. Economics has the word home built into it in the Greek. And economics deals with goods that are finite, tangible, and local, including food, clothing, housing, and even free time. Crematistics is different. It's less tied to the house and the home, more closely related to acquiring wealth in the abstract, speculating wealth to gain more wealth, pursuing wealth for the sake of wealth. And this is thought to be made possible by the adoption of the sign. When gold coins or dollar bills, for instance, are the foundation of our exchange, these things stand in for goods and are not good in and of themselves. The dollar bill is itself especially iterable. A nearly infinite number of them could be printed. With a potentially infinite supply of money to be accumulated, so an infinite desire to accumulate money is born. People start wanting infinitely. The goods of the oikos, however, are not thus. One can only eat so much food, live in so many places, or have so much free time. Desire for such goods is soon satiated, and we can turn our attention to other parts of life outside of the economic arena. But when we engage in crematistics, it's a task that will necessarily keep us occupied and unhappy forever, always wanting more, always thinking that everything in some way relates to money, because there literally always is more money you could be earning. The differences between economics and crematistics, then, might be thought to be twofold. First, in terms of their different focus, economics on the goods of daily life, crematistics on abstract desire for wealth, and second, on the medium that creates that desire. Economics is involved with pursuing tangible things such as food and clothing, which are finite, thus creating finite desires that are satiable, and crematistics is involved with pursuing a symbol that can be created, printed, and reprinted infinitely, thus co-creating infinite desire to accumulate. But there is an important third way in which they are distinct. Oikonomy as goods cannot be counterfeited, but the money used in crematistics can indeed turn out to be fake. It's hard to imagine accidentally living in a fake house, <laughs> or, worse yet, being tricked into eating a completely fake meal. None of this makes sense. But faking a dollar is not that hard to do. Worse yet, the fake money could possibly even be used to buy a thing we think of as a real good. We could counterfeit dollar bills and then use them to buy food. All true. But even worse yet, we could take the counterfeit money, invest it, and it could give birth to a profit of real money. What is traditionally particularly disturbing about counterfeit money is the way in which it challenges platonic metaphysics. This denotative theory of language, I think, is all wrong. And consequently, so is the denotative theory of money. We can see this when we begin to apply phenomenology to the question. <coughs> Words. Words are one way of making things present. Things can come to presence in a variety of different ways, just as they can be seen from a variety of different angles. This is because presence always involves some absence. An absence 
absence itself is not a mere erasure or a lack of experience. Absence is a positive experience, an experience with content, we might say. Thus, if we were to take money in a non-denotative manner, then a dollar would not be a mere sign or a pointer to something other than itself. Rather, money would be a way of making something present, present in a mostly absent way, but still present. The problem with money is thus not in its ontology, not in the way in which it has being. Rather, the problem with money has to do with how it's experienced as a value. And we saw that categoriality shows us how we immediately experience values. And this is certainly true with money. But there's a history to how seeing gets constructed. Seeing is not something that takes place in a vacuum. We get habituated into taking things around us in a certain way. And in this manner, the values that we immediately take to be in something are always debatable. And the same is true with seeing. If I see a mannequin in a store window, there's always a chance that I'm wrong. It might be a human. If I see a mannequin move, I might be called on to question my previous experience. This is because, under the right conditions, humans and mannequins can appear to consciousness as indistinguishable. I might be wrong in what I experience, because perception is never complete. Objects have infinite horizons. They can appear in infinite ways. And when some aspect of an object is present, so much more is always absent. I am always open to the possibility of being wrong in what I take something to be. And this is true with values as well. The immediate way in which I experience the goodness of you bringing me a plate of cookies, for instance, could be reevaluated later when I find out that you poisoned the cookies. But the point is that a value determination is directly there in both cases. And we experience money as immediately valuable. And by this I mean to say that most of us experience dollars and other American currency as immediately valuable, because the thing about foreign money is that until you get used to it, it's hard to see it as valuable. Perhaps you've been in another country and you've had this experience yourself. Typically, it leads to people spending more money than they normally would. That's because when an American who's never seen a euro, for instance, first sees those strangely colored bits of paper in weird sizes, these bills don't immediately appear as valuable. Consequently, we tend to spend them with less thought because giving them up to someone doesn't immediately seem like giving up something of worth. If you reach into your pocket and give me a $20 bill, there's a feeling that goes along with that. You take the bill to have value without having to think about it and add value onto the immediate experience. It just appears as valuable from the get-go. And we could be more specific. Different denominations have different immediate experiences of value. And this cannot be translated into an equation. It's not as if a $20 bill has an immediate experience of being twice as valuable as a 10, but one-fifth as valuable as a 100. Rather, there's an immediate sense, at least for most of us who are not rich, that the various denominations of paper money have immediately experienced different senses of worth that go beyond mathematics. To hand a homeless person a dollar bill immediately feels one way. To hand a homeless person a 20 feels a different way. Now I'm going to ask Danielle and Reese to come out here for a moment because I want them to help me actually hand out money to you. Not that you're homeless beggars, but I promise that we're actually going to pass out some money and so that's what we're going to do. I was given an honorarium for speaking here tonight and I'm sincerely grateful and honored and what I'm about to do and say in no way is meant to suggest anything that would indicate otherwise. I consider it a privilege to speak to you. I'm grateful to have my expenses met in getting here. But it seems strange to me to accept money for a talk in which I'm ultimately going to call for the end of all money. And so the first step is giving it away. So, I have two bags filled up with cash. Um, there's $200 in here in single bills. About $140 are in ones, and the rest are in other denominations, so most people are going to get a one. Uh, they're going to go out to the audience and actually pass this out to anybody who wants money. You get free money tonight, real money. So all I ask is that you only take one, uh, and as we move it along, and enjoy. <laughs>
Everybody get some money? All right. When I was here at uh, Lebanon Valley College a couple of years ago, uh, I told a story about the Cave Foundation. On August 23rd, back in 1994, the Cave Foundation, which was a music and art duo consisting of Bill Drummond and Jim Connie, they burnt a million pounds sterling in cash on the Scottish island of Jura. This money represented the bulk of all the money that they had made as the Cave Foundation, which was the uh, United Kingdom's most successful pop group in the early 1990s. And the duo called it a work of art. It said that they did this to make a statement about art and the way in which British economic policies were harming so many people. They actually burned a million pounds and they videotaped it. And after they did, the group came under attack from everybody. They even received death threats. People cried out about all the good things that could have been done with the cash, and now it was just burned to ashes. Homeless people could have been fed, orphanages could have been built, and now it was all gone. What it did was raise a bunch of questions about art as well as economics. Suppose that one million pounds had been spent to make a movie. Would it have been less of a waste? Would it have mattered what the movie was about? Would it have mattered if the movie made a profit or was any good? Why does it matter what you do with the capital that makes art possible? And is it justified to use violence against the thing that you think is violent? So, I promised everybody that you would be richer tonight. And now, whether or not you took any money from Daniel and Maurice, I'm about to make every single person here richer by increasing the value of the money that you have in your pocket right now. <laughs> Here we go. This is what's left of my honorary.
though they're pretending to. It is instead the trace of an idea, the faint outline of a suggestion, a worry that the language of markets and money cannot capture what we mean by value at all. And this is a hint that perhaps something is terribly wrong in our thinking about money. It's the main hint, in fact, that drives us toward thinking that perhaps something is wrong with the whole way of thinking about value whenever it's put in terms of money, markets, and even exchange of any kind. <laughs> money, it's true, is not a denotative sign. And money has immediate value built into it. But this doesn't mean that all is right with the world. We can be wrong about our immediate experiences. And indeed, it's as if we've not only been looking at a mannequin and mistaking it for a person. We have fallen in love with the mannequin, taken a mannequin home to meet our parents, had some sweet mannequin sexy time, started a family with a mannequin, devoted our life to making a mannequin happy, and now we're wondering, is something amiss? There's an ancient myth that everyone to this day more or less believes. Aristotle believed it, and Smith believed it. They didn't even consider it possibly to be a myth. It never entered their minds that the story couldn't be true. Nearly the whole world believes it today, but it doesn't even register as a fanciful story that might need to be thought about as true or false. It's just taken as obvious fact. And that is the belief that before any society invents or uses money, that they use a system of bartering to exchange goods. A wonderful story, apart from the fact that pretty much every single word is a lie. And that lie begins with the historical claim itself. There is no bartering to which we could ever revert or from which we emerged, because there has never been a bartering culture. Never mind that Adam Smith himself cites examples of bartering societies in his 1776 book, The Wealth of Nations. Savage societies that have not yet invented money to which we can compare the, achieve compare the achievements of money-rich Europe. How did Smith come up with these examples? How did he come across them? He made them up. None of it was true. He reported it as fact because it felt right. But with money comes debt. And debt, not merely the actual debt itself, but the concept of debt, has proven to be the most successful means of class oppression ever. When you owe something to me, I essentially own you. And worse yet, you think it's all a question of your duty, your need to be moral, your responsibility to make good on that debt. Meanwhile, those in control of the money, meaning those in control of the debt, set out to destroy the world as if it's a child's game, all the while blaming the powerless for the world's wasteful destruction.
When Jesus feeds the multitudes with just a few loaves of bread and fishes, the point of the story is not that Jesus did some crazy magic to create food out of thin air like Chris Angel or Santa Claus. Rather, I take the point of this story to be that if there are hungry people around, we have a duty to find a way to feed them even when it seems impossible. I take this story to be about the overwhelming, infinite duty toward hospitality and social justice. I take it to mean that giving food to our neighbors is never a question of exchange, of markets, even of math. A math that would have us calculate profits and losses. A math that would have us calculate just how many loaves do you need? Let me see if I can spare any. Don't have so many. A math that makes it possible to figure debt. This is the meaning, I think, of Christianity on a deep level. He's canceling the debt record. More than this, he's arguing for no longer thinking of morality or politics or even economics in terms of debt. Some of the way in which money is valuable, the way in which it is something of value, is that it's actually incapable of talking about ethical value at all. Yet it takes over our normative discourse without remorse. Ethics will not escape the language of debt as long as there is money in our society. And if we are left to wonder how we might ever get along without them, we actually have many fine examples. One of them is in our homes. For instance, I don't pay my fiance to do the laundry. She doesn't pay me to do the cooking. I don't exchange money with her when she fills up my water bottle before I go to school. She has never offered me a penny when I pick her up from dance teaching. And these activities are not seen as gifts. It's not as if there's a sense that each movement in the relationship, each moment of doing something for each other, is being tallied, and thus indebting me or working off what I owe her. It is not even really exchange. Rather, this is just life. To return to philosophy for one last example, we could return to Socrates and to his conclusion. To one final story about the first lover of wisdom coming to an end. Socrates, the thinker who began it all for us in the West, is in prison, dying from the poison that he was ordered to drink after having been found guilty of corrupting the youth of Athens with philosophy. His disciples are gathered around him, and he's talking to them about his immortal soul returning to the realm of the forms, how this is a good thing so no one should be sad. The poison begins working on him from the ground up. His feet go numb. His legs give out. Still, he takes the chance to speak of his theories and his wisdom and his self-proclaimed lack of wisdom. The poison moves into his abdomen. It will soon be in his heart and lungs. He teaches his students as the minutes grow short. He puts every bit of his strength toward remaining the true philosopher. As the hemlock makes its final play and Socrates is moments from death, he motions to one of his most beloved students, Crito, to come close. We lean in close to, ready to receive the final words from this great man, ready to hear with his last breath what it will bring us, how it will bear witness to the whole of his life, to our search for meaning in the world. Crito, Socrates whispers, I owe a rooster to Asclepius. Don't forget to pay the debt. I pray that we can somehow do better than this in our collective future.
Thank you so much. Good night.